of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for the kind invitation. It's, it's a really nice place um, for the first time here and a very well organized conference. It, it works, right? Yeah, okay, good. Okay, and then, well, uh, my talk will be about biomax imaging. Let me start by saying uh, there is really no modern biology and medicine without imaging. Yeah? Basically, I will talk about some uh, typical challenges and uh, then gi give some example problems and uh, share with you some of uh, solutions or potential solutions. Mostly, I will talk about our own research work. And, okay, today uh, there is also always some need to talk about machine learning. I will do exactly the same from the perspective of biomedical imaging. And finally, I will try to give some uh, future uh, 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 outlook uh, from one particular perspective. And you all know different uh, uh, medical imaging modalities, like you see here, we know from the literature there are a high number of different algorithms for different problems, and given that, we can realize wonderful applications. Yeah. And there is, I think, probably some misunderstanding about biomedical image analysis. And uh, I guess some people, or probably many people, think it's just an application of all the wonderful methods we know from image analysis to solve biomedical imaging problems, application of existing algorithms. But this is not really true. Indeed, we see quite a lot of novel problems. I will go through some of them, rising from the, this field. And then, when we need novel algorithms, in order to solve the biomedical problems in a better way. Okay. So there are specific challenges in this field that require specific solutions. And i like to share with you some of the uh, challenges. They are in some sense general, in other sense also a little bit my personal view of the story. So we will see uh, the contents constancy modeling for motion analysis, noise modeling, and so on and so forth, I will briefly go through all the challenges and yeah, uh, say some words about uh, some potential solution. And one very interesting observation here is uh, you can find in literature many methods that work very, very well for normal images but not for images from patients. <laughs> but this is uh, uh, particular the kind of images we are interested in, basically. So, yeah. mm -hmm. And this is somehow related to database design. Every benchmark database should contain a sufficient portion of abnormal images yeah, of different kinds. Yeah. And, okay, let me start with this topic, motion analysis. Motion can be done in different ways. One is uh, registration, the other is optical flow. Here you see, oh. Yeah, okay. You see uh, 2D optical flow fields and 3D optical fields for two different modalities. I will come back to the modality, uh, modality data. The issue here is for motion analysis, let's say here, uh, there's very frequently used assumption. is so-called intensity constancy. It's a very simple one. Basically, it means despite of motion, the intensity or uh, color doesn't change. You, know? uh, you see here at position x, y at time t, you have this intensity. At the next time, it moves to x plus u, y plus v, the intensity remains more or less constant because we need some constraint to solve the uh, mathematically imposed problem. And this is widely assumed in literature, but it can easily be shown that it does not apply to several imaging modalities. I will show you, uh, I think, one or two, at least one or two such situations. Look at this very abstract situation. We have two images, template reference. We like to do a, a motion analysis to register one of them to the other. Yeah? Registration motion means you 
for each point, you like to find out the corresponding part in the next image. Yeah? OK, let's say, let's try to find a corresponding point for this one. Where it is? Somewhere here, perhaps. But you see a problem. All the points here in this very dark ring, they are very, very dark. And all the points here in the dark ring, they are dark, not so dark. Yeah? It means there is some motion, but there is also some change of intensity values. This is caught by the physical principles used in different devices. So it means, this fact simply means, if we do motion analysis in this situation, we need two things at the same time. We need to determine the movement of the position. And also, we need to determine the intensity change at the same time in one single process, the so-called intensity modulation. Yeah? It's something beyond or the typical motion analysis. And, but as I said, we, we do need some constraints. Otherwise, we will not be able to solve the mathematically e post problem behind it. So it means if we have to forget this constancy constraint or uh, intensity constancy, we need something else. So one potential solution is here. It means, well, each pixel may change its uh, uh, intensity. But the sum of all incentive values in one image remains a constant. And there is indeed, in case of some physical uh, measurements, uh, 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 very straightforward uh, interpretation. In case of PET imaging, it means the radioactivity, which is injected in the body of the patient, cannot expand escape during the measurement, unfortunately. This is not good for the patient, but necessary, simply necessary. But this gives us a global constraint in order to solve the problem. And one way of motion analysis, as said, registration, the idea here is very simple, at least theoretically. You have the template, you look for some transformation y, and then you compare the transformation formed template with some reference. This is a difference function. The difference between the reference and the transferred, uh, transformed template. Then you try to find a um, um, uh, transformation so that the dis difference is minimized. And in this case, we need to typically need a, a regularization to make the problem solvable. But in case of the mass preserving, we need to develop a step more we need to extend this formulation, and we have developed the so-called Vampire algorithm for doing that. And as for the motion analysis, as I said, there are two forms, registration or optical flow. Um, in some cases, you can apply both. And indeed, taking the same constraint here, mass preserving, we also have developed a method for optical flow. Oops. Somehow it's blocked. Ah, okay. Ah. And I will no, do not go into any detail. But the point here is, this is uh, uh, much faster than the registration. Actually, our uh, experience here is, indeed, uh, they show the two approaches for optical flow and for registration. They do show relative similar results. Actually, this optical flow solution will be built in the next generation of PET uh, by uh, Siemens. The, we did it in a very close collaboration with Siemens, and, uh, well, our code was not optimized at all, but uh, they optimized our code in different uh, aspects and uh, uh, plan to build it into the next generation device. But for what? For what kind of application? Here you see the potential application. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah, OK. Yeah, OK. Uh, the motion is very slow here. Uh, it's related to the motion correction in PET device. 
Uh, one particular aspect of PET is it takes a long time, typically 10 minutes, 20 minutes. And in that case, the patient is somehow in this form. No global body motion, that's fine, but the patient is alive. The heart is beating logically, right? So there's some heart movement here, and this leads to this kind of measurement. This is quite typical. With the enlarged uh, uh, measure of the heart, and the shape of the heart uh, uh, wall is much thicker than uh, uh, it really is. And we have applied this kind of motion detection to find out the different uh, the motion between the different stages, unfortunately, it's somehow, I don't know why. And uh, here, basically, during the 20 minutes, there is a motion, uh, a heart beating, and then we try to find the motion between the heart beating phases and correct it. And finally, we can provide this motion corrected uh, measurement. And this is a motion correction to be built into the next generation of uh, 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 Siemens for a PET device. And now I come to the second issue, noise modeling. So uh, you see here the quite popular mod uh, modeling. You have uh, unbiased, perfect signal. You have some additive uh, uh, noise source, mostly yeah, modeled by Gaussian. Uh, there are some reasons why Gaussian is so popular. But on the other hand, you see here, Gaussian model is not suitable indeed in some situations, probably in many situations. And for instance here, the, in PET device, and here also in this remote sensing device, and you see what's the difference? The difference here, the noise part also depends on the signal U. So this is kind of signal dependent uh, 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 noise. And what makes it difficult is here, you see the additive noise, and you see the signal dependent. In case of high signal levels, the distortion will become much higher. Yeah? It's, it's a ter terrible distortion process. And if you compare the Gaussian uh, noise here with this Poisson or speckled noise typically visible in ultrasound, you will see this kind of signal should be diff more difficult to deal with than such normally distributed noise. And this is reflected in segmentation, in motion analysis. In case of optical flow instance, I have shown you this very simple assumption, typically used, and indeed, in case of in case of uh, an ultrasound, we, have, we are faced with this signal-dependent model. You see, again, this noise part is dependent on the signal. Yeah? So in this case, it can easily be shown that the intensity constant does not apply anymore. And uh, fortunately, we can replace it again with something else called, uh, you see here, the individual intensity will change, but the distribution of the intensity values in a small neighborhood, they, it will remain constant. And we just use this constraint and develop an optimal, uh, optical flow algorithm. And we could show that with this yeah, improved algorithm, we could achieve, depends on the signal images, 20 to probably 70% improvement of the optical flow optical flow uh, computation. Yeah. And so the noise modeling does not only influence motion analysis, it also influences uh, uh, segmentation. And recently we have done a literature re review checking the segmentation methods which consider noise model inside. And there are not so many. And many of such methods they are limited to some particular noise model, not a general consideration. Yeah? And we, are, we were working on general models. These are two methods from my lab, and they consider 
general noise models, and in one case, we do need the mathematic, mathematical definition of the model. In the other case, we even do not need to know the exact model of the noise. Yeah? And why this is useful? This is just one example here. You see an ultrasound image, and you see the labeling from two physicians here, and they differ a little bit. Actually, they may differ even more. Yeah? And here you see, if we apply the Gaussian mass model for the segmentation, the result never becomes reasonable. It's, yeah? But if we apply this, this is a correct noise model for ultrasound device, then we are in, uh, indeed able to get a much better segmentation. This can be quantitatively uh, 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 demonstrated yeah? in comparison with the ground truth. This example simply says it makes sense to use, consider, and use the right noise model, not only for uh, motion analysis, but also for segmentation. Yeah. And shape modeling is also a big issue, actually. Looking at this ultrasound, typically segmentation is based on some counter information. But look at here. There is no counter visible here if you apply any level set or whatever, you will find a counter, hurt counter going yeah, outside of the hurt counter. It means we need some constraining heart model for doing this particular segmentation. And this is quite uh, typical. And uh, actually, uh, unfortunately, this should be some optical flow in, yeah. Uh, and based on this shape uh, information and motion information, we could do a classification of the so-called heart remodeling, which, is, which segment is healthy, which segment is not healthy. That, but the issue here is not the classification, but the segmentation. We do need a statistical model of the heart for this segmentation problem. And another issue, another application field uh, example is you see Probably, I just show the video. Yeah, it's a biological application. We like to track all such larvae and find out their contour and resolve the collision. And also, in this case, all the larvae they are they do not show any difference in shape, in uh, in brightness, or whatever. They are very much the same. Yeah. And we needed such statistical model of the shape of this class of objects for a, re a very reliable uh, uh, collision analysis. So this shows just the importance of statistical shape modeling, which is quite unique in some sense for biomedical imaging. And and in today's time of machine learning, we all know we need annotation. Yeah? We need annotation at, for at least two purposes. One is learning. The other is for performance evaluation. Yeah? We need to compare, let's say, our segmentation results with some yeah, uh, annotated uh, ground truth. But in case of biomedical applications, there are some additional difficulties. Yeah? And uh, you see here, we cannot involve anyone else than domain expert. Yeah? Such internet solution as Mechanic Turk is not useful in general. And, but the physicians, they are even more busier than us. Yeah? And also, even domain experts, they have uncertainty. For the medical annotation, we observe different physicians, they labor differently. After the labeling, you cannot, they cannot uh, come to the unified opinion in some sense. And also, we have 3D database of time, 4D, of large size. So there is a lot of uh, uh, challenges here. In case this so-called uh, ultra microscopy with very high solution, and uh, some domain experts, they spend several weeks for just partially annotating two data sets. Partially, not the whole data. This is a hard job for them. And we use such data for 
uh, uh, finding the cells, and uh, finally the nuclei of the cells for quantification purpose. And even giving such validation data, so the question is how we validate algorithms for biomedical uh, uh, imaging. For instance, segmentation, motion analysis. You see his standard, two standard approaches. You know, we have some ground truths, for instance, for segmentation, then we just compare our automatically segmented result with such ground truths. That's fine. And also, very popular is, yeah, synthetic data. There are models for small animals, for per, uh, people, and we can s simulate the working of some device, let's say, here you see here, ultrasound. Yeah? Given such a simulation, we have ground truth for motion. For segmentation, it's fine. You can ask uh, physicians to mass labor. But can you ask a, a physician to specify the optical flow vectors? Nobody can do that, really. Yeah? So in this case, we have used such synthetic data. And uh, th these are very popular in general practice. But in case of medic medicine or biology, there, are, there is a different way, somewhere in between. So this is my colleague, Klaus Schäfer. He has built a so-called phantom. It's just a hardware of body with all the uh, uh, organs which are controlled somehow physically and with all the parameters of the uh, organ movement are controlled by a software. So everything is under control in some sense. So we also use this particular form of data acquisition for algorithm validation. So th these are the two standard forms of validation. This is some very specific form in medical imaging. Yeah. And so the final one, a very a single uh, slide, and uh, here is a problem very popular since maybe 20 years, retinal images. There are different databases, there are uh, survey papers, there are hundreds of papers on this topic. And uh, today it's hardly possible to improve the performance measure. It's 9, 0.99, I don't know, something. But And today, we are faced with 3D data of so-called OCT angiography, which much poor quality. It's much higher challenge here to deal with these kind of images compared to the classical retinal images. And these are just a few examples of yeah, challenges and some ideas and mostly a solution from our side. I really want to uh, emphasize uh, uh, the work we have been done. Uh, it's a kind of uh, model-based. Uh, I typically do not say we develop a solution for ultrasound. We develop a solution for PET. This is not true. Our work is motivated by ultrasound PET, but our algorithm is based on some theoretical model as soon as some other device satisfies the same model assumption, and hopefully our algorithm will be useful for them as well. So I call it somehow model-based solutions to, made, to make our solutions as broadly applicable as possible. So talking about biomedic imaging, there is actually another aspect I've not mentioned before, uh, so far, imaging. Yeah? And I have been talking about image analysis, yeah? But the question is, where do the images come from? from? From some device, that's true. But sometimes there is some option for developing some, such image acquisition techniques, and uh, we are quite happy to have some projects in this uh, aspect. So i like to share you two projects. One is related to biology, uh, a very related major one, this is uh, medicine for topic image acquisition. And 
One, you see here the so-called uh, fruit, fruit flies. This is one of the most important objects for the, the biology study. And uh, years ago, people started to use imaging techniques. And this is a typical setup. You have some table, you have the agar, and they, the lava move above the table, above the agar sh uh, sheet, and you have camera, you have lighting. And this leads to typically this kind of images with uh, problems. You have object reflections, light refraction, whatever, and uh, the objects look like this. And uh, it's very, uh, not very detailed imaging. For that reason, we have been working on another measurement principle. Well, basically, the principle is very uh, simple and well known from the uh, human comp uh, computer interaction community. We have adapted it into, to this setup. It's based on infrared setting, and basically the light is yeah, kept within the glass and the agar. As soon as there is a larvae, the light will be reflected here in this direction, for instance, the camera. You see the table and the camera here. And I will not go to uh, the technical details, but just uh, show you some images. Uh, the effect here is we have extremely high contrast, basically more or less black-white, black not truly black-white, but high, very high contrast. And uh, this makes the segmentation tracking uh, easier. But still, we have the tracking problem, we have the problem with the collision analysis. And actually, I have shown you as this small example with collision analysis before. Yeah. The funny thing here is, as a comparison, look at this. This is a conventional uh, imaging technique. And there is uh, the result from our imaging technique. And we can see through the body. We can see into the organs using this simple setup. Yeah. And uh, this is actually the very first time uh, it becomes possible without using a microscope. And this enables us to do investigations like uh, starting the heartbeat pattern and to start the so-called rolling behavior on the right side. And for me, this behavior is totally inter un not interesting. But for biologists, this is extremely interesting for them. Yeah. And we are, also, we are also to deal with the different uh, stages of the life cycle. And interesting, we can also work with the different uh, other objects, like here, planari, sea elegans. All these larvae, draws, uh, fruit flights, and planari, or sea elegans, they build the body of the study objects in biology. And here is one example with plant. Uh, we are also able to measure plant. Yeah? So the next step is the most recent setup is here. And in case of this table, we still need to prepare the measurement. Uh, take the larvae and prepare, put it on the table and measure. Yeah? So our idea, the most recent idea, is to do a long-term in-vial monitoring. It means we build a vial the fruit flies, they live in the vial, and we put a number of cameras, uh, right now five, and observe them, yeah? And using exactly the same principle, infrared lighting and so on and so forth, to obtain high contrast. And we are, follow, we are able to follow all the uh, 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 fruit flies for days. That's the reason why we call it Film, this is the name of the technology, for days. Yeah. For a high degree of performance uh, 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 behavior monitoring. So indeed, let me go back. Uh, very quickly, uh, the second medical project uh, about uh, PET imaging. Uh, I have been talking about this motion uh, uh, compensation for patients, right? Um, but in case of basic research, small animals are used, mouse and so, and so forth. And you cannot ask them to be quiet for 20 minutes, never. So the standard solution is here. 
anesthesia. This is done worldwide many times per day in basically every lab. And with well no problems. Yeah? So the medical people, they, know, they do know the problem related to this measurement. But there is not, no better solution. So we are now working on the following solution. Yeah? The best I show you is the solution. We have a chamber. We'll put the mouse into the chamber. You see on both sides there are two cameras. So you are well known with the vision, stereo vision on both sides. So we like to capture the 3D motion from both sides. And basically, what happens is you see the four cameras, two from each side. We have some uh, markers on the uh, fur because there are no visible features in some sense on the fur, unfortunately. And uh, so we need, uh, we need to solve a, a quite a number of uh, computer vision uh, challenges like uh, uh, high precision camera calibration and so on and so forth. Finally, what we have done is motion compensate image reconstruction. And this is a very hard job, and uh, I'm quite happy to see the first, very first results after a long time of uh, working on this project. Uh, you see a freely moving mouse for 45 minutes. This is the position of the nose uh, uh, tip, and he is the reconstructed. Uh, image. And here is some reference. Reconstruct means freely moving, motion corrected, and this is some reference. I will not go into the details of the reference, but this reference image gives you some indication how it should look like, more or less. But this is definitely not the ground truth. I have to, this is not the ground truth. And basically, we are able to make the first measurement using a freely moving mouse. Yeah. We are still improving this system. Hopefully one day we can apply it to realize improved measurement. So this is something about imaging. So challenges about image analysis, imaging uh, uh, acquisition. And now I'll come to say some words about machine learning. Machine learning has been used uh, from the very beginning for biomedical imaging, actually. But today, there are some very funny applications. And here, I uh, somehow come to the, one of the words in my title, potential, yeah? future. And this is a one realized application, yeah? segmentation, S nuclear detection. You see here, yeah, the image. Here, the green spots are the correctly detected ones, but you still see yellow points and red points. They, may, they mean false positive, false negative. Look at this, realized by a, 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 a deep CNN, there is still quite a lot of room for further improvement, actually. And this is one example for learning features for registration. Yeah? Uh, for time reason, I will sk skip this uh, slide. And uh, uh, actually, the next few slides, is, they are much more interesting from my point of view. Uh, this is some very funny project. Uh, the, the title is red. It means it's not from my lab. Okay? But I find it so interesting. Uh, look at this. Uh, the application here is a quantification. Uh, the physicians want to find the volume of the four parts of a heart. The heart is divided into four parts, left uh, atrium, right uh, 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 atrium, and uh, left and right ventricle. This is a quantification. Quantification is typically done by segmentation. If you have segmented well, afterwards you have emitted the volume. But the segmentation is extremely difficult here. Look at such images. How to separate the four parts. So the idea here is okay, to avoid, avoid the segmentation. Take a picture and try to learn some, find some very nice feature uh, representation. And then learn a function which provides four outputs for the four volumes. <laughs> it's a machine learning approach for an extremely difficult segmentation problem. As said, in the history, this kind of problem was solved by segmentation. And now people are trying 
to solve it by learning. And the next one is even more fancy. It's something for future. There's no good solution yet. And in a few months, it's a re more, uh, very recent, there will be a spe special issue in HP transactional medical imaging on machine learning for image reconstruction. Yeah? And this picture was used for the call for papers. On the left side, the, the measured signals. On the right side, some reconstructed image. And between a neural network. This is a real challenge to all people working in applied mathematics for image reconstruction. Uh, I uh, uh, worked very closely with my colleagues in applied mathematics. For instance, this pet small animal moving uh, measurement, we need to do the so-called motion compensated reconstruction. So this is not our beer. So we work together with them. Actually, I really, I, taught, I showed uh, the colleagues the, uh, the, uh, there this picture, this coffee, uh, call for paper. They are also very curious about the future, uh, uh, fu uh, future development here on the one hand. On the other hand, they were also a little bit pessimistic about their own future because they were trained for totally different methods. Yeah. And so I like to cite one sentence from this great Hinton. He said, two years ago, we should stop training radiologists right now because in five years, deep learning will have better performance. Yeah. Well, this is a very controversial topic, but there is substantial potential not to fully replace all the radiologists, uh, but to work with them together towards more efficiency and so forth, uh, and so far and so forth. And indeed, there is this uh, so-called uh, uh, AI versus doctor interactive graphic uh, uh, did by, uh, done by IEEE. Uh, uh, it, it should be updated uh, constantly or, uh, so that you see uh, for general diagnostics, still the doctors win. On the other hand, there are already some topics where the doctors lose. The machine learning solutions win, and here still not decided yet. And as said, this graphic uh, should be uh, uh, updated from time to time, and you can follow the most recent development uh, of the uh, fight between physicians, and machine learning systems. And I'd like to okay, use a few minutes, or probably one, uh, two minutes, for something we are developing, a two development, working in machine learning or deep learning, or probably some of you uh, use this very popular uh, library, Cafe, this is probably particularly in academic uh, 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 popular. But uh, the problem there, it has a number of advantages, but it has some disadvantages. How to use it? Yeah? You specify your neural network in form of such text format, and you train your network using some commands and so far. It's possible to work with it, no doubt, but it's probably better or more efficient to work in a different way. And uh, we have recently built a graphical tool, and uh, in that tool, you can specify graphically the architecture of your network. You can import existing neural networks from such a text uh, file. You can uh, modify it, save it, and finally, you can start training, observe the training, and look at the trained uh, features, a kind of visualization functions. And the basic fundamental uh, uh, motivation for this tool is to provide a more efficient way of prototyping a deep neural networks. Not only deep, it may be not so deep. And we have uh, used this uh, barista system for, uh, uh, for instance, this application, you have seen this setup. The problem there is 
It's for days. After some time, there will be some dirt, quite a lot of dirt collected. Look at this. It's not so easy to distinguish between the background and the objects. This is the ground truth. This is the image after, I don't know, one, one day or even longer. And uh, so we have designed a CN, not a surprising, not so deep. Why not so deep? Because we like to run it on such a, a microcomputer. Yeah. OK. And uh, indeed, we tested with, uh, for instance, random forest. Indeed, this CN solution provides the best performance so far. And so, so you are welcome to, if you are working with uh, Cafe, you are welcome to try our two barista. Yeah. The name Barista is easy to remember, yeah, for coffee. So I just uh, try to come to end of my talk uh, saying some words about future. Well, it's very difficult to say something about future, but, you know, I'm quite sure the machine learning part will be further developed, applied in different variants, including how to deal with limited annotation data, yeah? and how to train uh, uh, such deep learning models so that we can have more understanding, so that we can provide some explanation to the med uh, physicians how our model works and so on and so forth. This is clear future direction. But from a personal point of view, actually from the environment I'm working in, I'd like to point to another issue, which is probably not so uh, well known, so-called multi-scale imaging. Uh, I have shown you something about this ultra uh, microscopy, and you have also seen this hurt uh, PET imaging. This is full body scale. This is very, very fine scale, and we talk about full body scale, uh, molecular, uh, 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 cellular, subcellular, nanoscale, and so on and so forth. Here, basically, you, you see the whole bra branch of scale from very fine to very uh, core scale and different devices. Yeah? And the idea of multi scale imaging is to study medical problems by involving a series of devices, not only at one scale. The idea is, for instance, to use PET at the full body scale and try to understand the mechanisms behind it. Let's say if we see something on the skin and what happened behind it by using microscopic imaging and so on and so forth. We can involve basically a number of different imaging modalities from different scales. So there is a need from a large scale to the mid-size scale, very fine scale, and using the results back to the large scale which we can observe. Yeah? In this multi-scale uh, imaging setup, there are quite a number of new challenges. I call it just call them cross-scale, registration, segmentation, whatever, including visualization. And we need complex models for the relationship between the scales. Here, machine learning can very much, can be very much helpful, yeah. And actually, this is really new. I'm citing a very new uh, paper about uh, registration. In this very new paper, cross-scale registration is not even mentioned, yeah. So it's, it produced some, and actually we should tackle such multi-scale imaging in a very interdisciplinary way. Here's just one example for looking at this, uh, disease, and uh, we have colleagues in biochemistry, they look for uh, the so-called marker, how to identify something. And the, uh, the organic chemistry, uh, uh, radio chemistry, they develop the marker, probes, how to detect using chemical uh, materials. And then we have um, uh, 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 physicians, we have biologists, we have computer scientists, and so on and so forth. Basically, we are working in such a very interdisciplinary uh, uh, setup, uh, actually starting uh, quite long ago, this uh, research uh, uh, 
centers, let's say. This is an institute. This is the so-called cluster of excellence funded by the German government uh, uh, excellence initiative. Here you see about 90 research groups are working together from very different fields. Yeah? And it's not a theoretical group, a uh, number of 90s. We indeed work very closely together. Yeah? And the next step will be something for 19. And the idea, what's the problem here? It works well, but we are distributed in different buildings, distributed over the, uh, in the campus. The idea is to move 10 plus something key groups into one common building so that we will see each other every day, talk to each other every day, something like that. Yeah? Okay, that's this idea. And actually, we are applying a funding for the next period, Sales in Motion 2.0. And uh, so this is the uh, uh, end of my talk. And uh, basically, I've tried to discuss uh, some specific challenges of biomedical imaging. And some shared with you some of our solutions, some solutions from other research groups. But the issue is there are specific challenges. And it's not a simple application of existing uh, algorithms from image analysis. So I'd like to thank my collaborators and my PhD students for the results which I could share with you and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.